you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We have uh, been in a series uh, for about the last nine weeks looking at the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, many of you say the most famous sermon ever preached, uh, one of the uh, most read pieces of literature. And uh, we have been walking through that and have gotten all the way through uh, chapter 7, finished up on the sixth verse uh, last Sunday. And um, we're coming to an interesting part in the sermon. Uh, every, every pastor that preaches a sermon, there comes a point in the sermon where it's called landing the message. That's when you, you, you kind of ready to wrap it up and you begin to land the message. And as you get here to chapter 7 and, and get into verses 7 and following, it is Jesus is getting ready to, to land the message and begin to come to a, come to a close on this. And this has been an interesting week or two of study on this passage because I've, I think I'm seeing some things a little, uh, a little interesting and differently here with this passage. But what we need to do is to get you up to date as to, as to where we are. You see, when he started this sermon, it was Jesus speaking to followers. And he started out in what we call the Beatitudes, and he started out with the, where he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that set the foundation for everything. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That means bankrupt in spirit. It means that there's nothing I can do for my own salvation. It means I need to be totally dependent on God. What it means is that in my life, I need to come to that point to where I understand, like the seven that were baptized, that I have sinned, I've done things wrong, I've gotten off the mark. And I, because of that, it has separated me from a holy God. And I can live the rest of my life in that separation. And if I do, it will be a life of frustration. It will be a life that lacks purpose. And when I die, I will spend eternity separated from God. But if I get to the point where I'm bankrupt in spirit and I say, Lord, I need you. I understand what God's word says, that your son came, lived a perfect life, died on a cross to pay the penalty for my sins, to take all the sins that I committed, and he placed them on himself and died. And then three days later, God, you raised him from the dead. And when you did, it showed that you had conquered sin, conquered death, and that if I would put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then I would become a child of God. I would be adopted into the family of God. And once I'm adopted into the family of God, then I will live on this earth, live for Christ, and one day when I die, I step into eternity to spend eternity with God in heaven. And so with all of that, what Jesus is saying, if you come and you make a decision to be a part of this family, you're a part of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is that reign and rule of God in your life. And when you're in the kingdom, it means you're a kingdom citizen. So how are you supposed to live as a kingdom citizen? Any, anything that we join, any group or, uh, that we join, they give us some rules to live by. Well, what we have in the Bible is they say, this is how we are to live. This is what it means to be a kingdom citizen. And so for three chapters, Jesus lays it out. But as we've been going through this, when you just look at this whole thing, it's pretty overwhelming. It's pretty overwhelming. This is the life of a kingdom citizen. The life of a kingdom citizen involves being meek, merciful, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, pure in heart, one who's a peacemaker, one who controls his anger, does not hold on to bitterness but readily forgives others. You've conquered lust, and when wrong, you do not retaliate. You love your neighbor, you even love your enemies. Your motives are right, and they are pure. You lay up treasures in heaven rather than on earth. You're not anxious or worrying about tomorrow. You're not judgmental, and you're more concerned with removing a plank out of your own eye than pointing out the sawdust in someone else's eye. That's overwhelming. That is a lot. And when you read that, your first thought is, hey, this is just for those five-star spiritual recruits. It's not for me. It's for the advanced placement saints, those that are just so spiritual. And that's really what chapters 5, 6, and 7. And for me, just as the normal person, there ain't no way I can live up to that. But you see, that's what's so, why it's so wrong. You see, we're all equal when we come into the kingdom. And as we come into the kingdom and we read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus, when he is sitting there, he's talking to you and to me. 
He's not looking at super saints. He's just looking at flat out sinners like you and me. People that struggle every day. People that go through hard times, difficult times. People who stand up and do good some days fall on other days. People who show up sometimes and mess up other times. That's who he's talking to. And so as he talks to every one of us, this is what it means to be a kingdom citizen. This is the character and the conduct of a kingdom citizen. So as you read that and you're just thinking about that you're overwhelmed, all of a sudden, Jesus comes up and he says, let me tell you how you're going to be able to do this. It's not that you just got to bow up and grit your teeth and say, okay, I'm going to do these the best I can. No. He tells you what it is. If you got your Bibles open, I want to read it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 12. He says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if, he, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Bottom line. When we look at the Sermon on the Mount and we look at the character and the conduct of what it means to be a kingdom disciple, you cannot do it on your own power. The only way you will be able to do this is through the supernatural power of God. That's the only way. And so if you begin to attack these three chapters and you go out on your own, you're going to end up frustrated and defeated. But when Jesus lays this out saying, this is the conduct, this is the character of those in the kingdom, it pushes us and pulls me back to God to where I say, I've got to depend on him. And so as Jesus getting ready to land this plane and he said all these wonderful things, he then says, hey, ask. And it'll be given you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you. So how do we do this? How, what is this ask and seek and serve? Let me give it to you as easy as I can give it to you that can stay in all of our minds. Are you ready? Number one, this is the first thing. That is eagerly pray to God. Eagerly pray to God. I love the word eagerly. Now when you think of something where you're eager, that means you're excited about it. Is that correct, choir? Are you eager for the uh, Christmas by candlelight? Yes. Did you hear that? See, you're eager because they're eager. All right. Eager. I mean, that's an anticipation. That's excitement. Eagerly pray to God. Now, see, some of you, if I said, okay, we're going to talk about prayer, you're just going, oh, gosh, I don't know if I want to do that. That's not the attitude. He said, eagerly pray to God. It's not a matter of us just sitting there trying to do everything on our own. It means that I need to eagerly come to God and I pray to him. When you look at the character and the conduct that's expected of a kingdom citizen, you will see a life that is filled with purpose, with meaning, with joy, with challenge, and making investments for all eternity. And the only way to live it is through the power of God. So you eagerly pray to God. You pray to him for his strength, his power, his guidance, and his provisions. Jesus said, hey, you got to ask, you got to seek, and you got to knock. Just keep this statement in mind. Prayer is to be your first option, not your last resort. Prayer is to be your first option, not your last resort. If you're truly going to be a kingdom citizen and you want to try to live the things that Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, it is not that whenever something comes up, let me turn to someone else and talk to them about it. That may be helpful, but that shouldn't be first. First should be on my knees praying to God, going to him eagerly praying to God and say, God, I'm needing your help. I need direction on this particular area. Make that your first option. Number two. Second is to persistently pray to God. Persistently pray to God. Now, in the Greek, Greek, in the Greek language uh, here, uh, there, uh, this is what is called like a, uh, a continuous tense. And it's an imperative, it's a command, but it's continuous. So if you had to um, uh, literally interpret that word, it would say, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, Okay. It's not a one-time thing. It's not ask, it'll be given you. No, keep on asking, 
keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And it raises in the intensity. Asking, seeking is even more than asking, knocking even more than seeking and asking. So there's an intensity there and there's a persistence there. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. If we are going to live as kingdom citizens, it does not mean that we set up one time a week where we come to God and say, hey, here's a list of a couple things that I need help on. No, it's 24-7. Persistently, I am praying to God. Consistently, I'm asking him, I'm seeking, and I am knocking. Now, just look at what it says. Keep on asking. Keep on asking. That is when you come with empty hands, recognizing that you have a need for God and you ask him. And you say, God, this is a need that I have. I'm not sure how to handle this. I'm coming to you. I need some assistance to have a pure mind. I need some assistance to have a pure heart. I need some assistance to have a forgiving spirit. I need some assistance to take away that critical anger spirit that has been grabbing my heart. You come to him and you ask him. And before you go to a self-help group, you come to God first. And once you come to God first, one of the things he may lead you to is you need to go work with another group but let's start with him first so you keep on asking then you keep on seeking keep on seeking now when you see keep on seeking it means that you get actively and you pursue God's will so I keep on asking God I'm asking you for this but then I keep on seeking it is that God I'm asking for this and I'm going to also pursue some answers through your direction and so it's like if you ask oh God I need a job well pursue job leads if you come and you say, well, God, these are some things that I need some help in, then, then pursue those. God can direct you on that. So it's not just a matter of sitting in your room praying and waiting for God to give you a magic pill that all of a sudden says, hey, I've, I've got this down. He says, no, you keep on asking. And when you keep on asking, you just keep on seeking. And seeking is not a one-time thing. It is like a series of events. If I can put it as simple as possible, what God is saying here, we are to seek like a mom seeks, not like a dad or a husband seeks. We'll just explain it like that. How many times does it happen? Dad, open up the refrigerator, looking for ketchup. There's no ketchup. And so you call your wife and you say, hey, there's no ketchup in the refrigerator. She said, did you look? Duh, yeah. Like, what did you do, Danny? Well, I opened the door and I looked and it's not there. Did you move anything? Well, no, no. Okay, I'll be there in just a minute. What happens when your wife got there? Everybody's been there. What did she do? She opened it up, and guess what she did? She moved something and moved something else and says, here it is. In fact, I bought two. Here's a second one if you want that one too. <laughs> Have you been that way? That's the way we think. Okay, I'm just going to seek this one time. What our wives do is to say, it might not hurt you. You might want to move a sheet of paper over. You might find it here. You might push this over to the side. You open up a refrigerator, move a few things around. You seek, you find it. It's there. And Jesus is saying, if you just keep on seeking, you will find it. And, and it, it's a process that you continue on. So you just keep on asking God. And you keep on seeking. And as you keep on seeking, then you will find. And then it ties into Jeremiah 29, 13 when he says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart seeking keep on asking keep on seeking and then he says keep on knocking that means like passionately pounding on the door knocking on heaven's throne room persistently and there's nothing wrong with that God's never intimidated by that he asks us to do that you pray persistently you seek persistently you knock persistently and when you're knocking, you're asking, Jesus, all these virtues that you've expounded right here in the Sermon on the Mount, I would so much love that to be a part of my life. And you just keep pounding and saying, God, this is what I desire. And Jesus is telling us, don't hold back, but go to God and ask him for your need. You see, when in the kingdom of God, it requires a poverty of spirit, a purity of heart. It requires truth, compassion, a life of integrity. And we don't really have these among, in, in ourselves. So we have to come to God for these, to give us that pure heart, pure mind, compassion, truth, a life of integrity. We need to ask him, and we ask them persistently. And so the question would come, you say, well, why doesn't God just give us those good things right away anyway? Why can't I just sit there and pray for something, and then all of a sudden God says, oh, yeah, good, I'll just give you that. Well, 
There's a statement that I read that I, I, really, I really like that I think drives this home. And it says, the period of time between the offering of our prayers and his answer is the crucible of life which shapes us into his image. I mean, just sit there for a moment. The period of time between the offering of our prayers, when I first start praying for something, and his answer is the crucible of life which shapes us into his image. It's what God's greatest desire is for us to be like Christ. And if we want to be shaped into the image of Christ. In order to do that, we have got to walk through life and walk through a faith journey with God. And we need to say persistently, Lord, I'm going to be calling out to you. I'm going to be persistently praying. I'm persistently seeking and knocking because I want to continue this faith journey. And it is in that crucible of life that begins to shape us into the image. And there's lots of testimonies out here. It's how we walk through those tough times of life that we begin to lean on God and learn from God, and then all of a sudden we understand what God means when he says mercy. We then understand what it means when God says forgiving spirit. Then we begin to understand what it means about don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough anxieties of its own. You know, I've, I've been really blessed. I, you know, my life is not a perfect life, and, and I've got, you know, cares and needs and things like everyone else. But, you know, for the most part, it's, it's been pretty smooth. And it was four years ago, it was four years ago this month that a doctor was telling me that, you know, your PSA count's kind of high. And we've been tracking this thing, and it's going higher. And so um, I think that you need to go in and, and need to get, get a biopsy. And, uh, you know, I've just been in great health all my life, and all my family has. And all of a sudden, when you go in and you, you get the biopsy, and then they call you, at the end of the year, as you're getting ready to move into the new year, and they say, it's positive. And like I've told you, I'm not much on medical stuff. And I said, positive, yay. He goes, no, that's not the good positive. <laughs> I went, oh. <laughs> he says, no, you have cancer. Uh, but then she was a cheery voice, but we think we got it. We're going to be okay. And, um, and I said, okay, thanks. And then all of a sudden, then Janice and I, now I've got to kind of start walking, walking through that time. And all those verses in there about seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things be added to you. And those things that talk about anxiety and if God is going to be able to, to take care of the lilies of the field and the birds and all those things, he's going to take care of you and he's going to walk with you through this. And, hey, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough worries of its own. You just worry about today. As I walk through that process and then you have surgery and then all of a sudden he says, hey, we think we got it all. We, we, we think that's great. It, that, that wasn't the end. Because, you see, you have to go for follow-up visits. And so every three months you go and you do that for a few years and, and they do the blood test and they come back and they say, hey, it's, you're still, still cancer-free, still cancer-free, still cancer-free. And then you go from three months and then it's, oh, now we think we can go six months. But, you see, there's always that concern about what will that next test show. Because, like, there's no guarantee. But you see, what he says in Scripture is, hey, Dan, you just keep on asking, you keep on seeking, you keep on knocking. And if you keep with me as you walk through this journey, you're going to learn so much more about who I am and my grace. And guess what? When you learn so much about that, you're going to be a better minister to others that walk through some of those same, uh, those same valleys. And so we are to pray persistently. And when I'm praying persistently, it means I keep my focus on God. It's not me trying to be a good guy. It is me focusing on God and his power and his strength. So you pray persistently. Number three, expectantly pray to God. You persistently pray to God, but then you expectantly pray to God. You see what it says in verse 8? In verse 8 it says, For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be open." Wow, you look at that verse right there. And if you take this out of context, it's like that God is some great celestial slot machine where if I just keep pulling the handle, all of a sudden he's going to give me the answer that I need. But it's not that way at all. We can't sit there and say that everything we ask for, God's going to give us. Everything we seek, we're going we're to find. Or every, knock, every time we knock, the door's going to be open. The reason is because we're fallible people. And when we pray, there's some things that within our own flesh we're praying for that God knows is not right for us. And so God doesn't answer those prayers with a yes. 
I, I love the story of Howard Hendricks. Howard Hendricks was a, a seminary professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. And he tells a story about when he was growing up and, uh, and in kind of his young adult years, uh, different ladies would come up to them and say that, ooh, they sure wish their daughter would marry him. And uh, he says one mother came up to him and she says, Howard, I just want you to know that I am praying you will be my son-in-law. And Howard Hendricks, when he teaches his class, leans up and he says, have you ever thanked God for unanswered prayers? <laughs> Yeah, and I'm grateful too. How many prayers have you prayed to where now you look back in life and you say, oh, thank goodness, that one didn't get answered that way. You see, God doesn't have to be cajoled into giving us what we need, but his choicest blessings are reserved for those who value them and who show their application or their appreciation by asking persistently and expectantly. And so when you come to God, he says he loves it when you are persistent and when you've got an expectation that there will be an answer. You say, well, Danny, how can I even be more expectant in my prayers? Let me give you this. This is just bonus material. This is real quick, all right? Here's how you can be very expectant in your praying and, and praying that you feel that God would answer, all right? Number one is this, obey God's commands. Obey God's commands. It is about as simple as can be. If you're sitting there praying and say, I'd love for God to answer my prayers, well, obey God's commands. Look what he says in 1 John 3, 22. 1 John 3, 22, and whatever we ask, we receive from him. That's great, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. So let's obey God's commands. Number two is submit to God's will. Submit to God's will. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says it like this. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, so if I'm submitting to his will and I'm, and I'm getting an understanding of what his will is and I pray according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. It's because we've submitted to his will, we've asked a prayer that matches up with his will, and God answers it in the affirmative. And then number three is what we're talking about today, and that's persevere. Ask, seek, knock. You persevere. Ask, seek, knock. And when you persevere and you continue in praying, one of two things will happen. Either God will begin to direct you and say, you know what, you're heading in a wrong direction on that, and he'll begin to guide you over here. Or within his right timing, he may come and say, hey, now's your answer. This is it. But pray expectantly. You are a child of the king. You are a citizen of the kingdom. And so we are to be keeping on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. And that brings us to number four, and that is to embrace the character of God. Embrace the character of God. Verses 9 through 11, Jesus here just gives a, an interesting analogy for them. And he says in verse 9, he says, which one of you, if, he, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? He just kind of, it's almost like a ludicrous statement here. Uh, if your son came up to you and said, hey, dad, I'd like a piece of bread. Well, back then, they had little round stones, little flat stones that looked like little bread cakes. So what if your child came up to you and said, hey, dad, I'd like to have, uh, I'd like to have some bread. And you pulled out of your pocket a rock and gave him that stone and say, here you go, son. I'd say, no dad would do that. Or what if he says, hey, I'd like to have a fish. Okay, maybe give me a fish. So you take out a serpent and say, how would this do you on there? Oh, you ask that and your whole crowd is sitting there saying, well, no one would do that. Well, look what he says. Well, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who's in heaven give good things to those who ask him? It's an argument that goes from the lesser to the greater. And he says, even though you are evil, and by that he's not mean mean evil, he just means you are naturally you're we're selfish we have weaknesses and we have faults and so even in my selfishness my weakness and my faults if my daughter came to me and said dad i want a piece of bread i would not give her a rock if she says dad i'd like to have a fish i would not give her a serpent knowing i'm not a perfect dad but i would never do that that's what he's saying he says, you know, father, any father worth his salt would never do something like that. And he says, your heavenly father, who is so much greater than an earthly father, how much more will he give to his children? So when you're asking, seeking, knocking, 
you need to keep in mind the character of God in who you're praying to. Now, it's sad in our time and in our culture that when I throw out the word father, there are just too many people here that have got a horrible connotation as to what that means. Because you've had a terrible dad. And I don't mean one that just didn't spend time with you. I'm talking about one that just did things to you that were just not right. And treated you wrong and treated your mom wrong. And just did, just to me, just detestable things. And so when people stand up and they say, God is our father, you have this negative connotation as to who God is. Well, I want you to embrace the character of God. And I want you to see the father that he is. So that as a child goes to a father, you may have had a disappointing dad. But I want you to know that you have a heavenly father who is perfect. Just real quickly, just, just some, of the, um, some of the character that comes right out of this verse. The first character trait of God is trustworthy. He's trustworthy. I mean, just like he's saying, he's saying, you know, uh, if an earthly father would, would not give a stone for bread or a serpent for a fish, what do you think about a heavenly father? You can trust him. He's trustworthy. You can come to him. Second of all, not only is he trustworthy, but he's also good. And he says he gives you good gifts. He's a good father. And he has our best interest in mind. And he only knows good gifts to, to give to his children. Third of all, he's wise. He's wise because he knows what you need. In chapter 6, verse 32, it says that God already knows what we need. He already knows what we need. So this heavenly father that you're coming to is trustworthy, he's good, and guess what? You don't need to convince him what you need. He already knows what you need. He knows your needs. And so he's trustworthy, he's good, he's wise, and he is accessible. He is accessible. You see, some of you have said, I've never had a dad that was accessible, too busy, didn't ever have time for me, don't know where he is. You've got a God who's accessible 24-7, and he says, just come to me. And when you come to me, just keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, I'm accessible. Hey, one of my favorites, he's in control. He's in control. That's a layman word for sovereign. <laughs> he's in control. It says our Father, he's in heaven. And because he is in heaven... He is over everything, and he's in control. So look at this God. Look at this Father. When, when you are thinking, I want to try to live out what's going on in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, I come and I pray, I keep asking, I keep seeking, I keep knocking to one who is trustworthy, who is good, who is wise, who is accessible, and one who is in control. Kingdom citizen must maintain an attitude of perfect trust and have an eagerness to ask, to seek, and to knock. And when we do that, our God, our Father, says he will give us the good things to those who ask him. So what Jesus has done is laid out this incredible uh, passages on character and conduct and what it means to have superior righteousness and to have the right motives and the right values. And he's laid all of that out. And as he lays all of that out, and we're sitting there being overwhelmed, he then says, and this is how you do it. This is how you do it. You keep on asking. You keep on seeking. You keep on, on knocking. You just maintain that 24-7 relationship with God. And when you do that, then you're going to see these things become a reality in your life. In the very end of it, just to me, it just kind of sums it up in verse 12. And that means that we are to love and serve others, and we love and serve others through the power of God. Love and serve others through the power of God. The golden rule, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, you do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This is the law and the prophets. This is what they were supposed to do in the Old Testament, and this is what we're supposed to do if you're going to be a follower of Christ. And that is to love and serve others through the power of God. Do you, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. That means you be proactive. You be the one that starts it out. You be the positive one. It's not do to others before they do to you. You do to others as you would want them to do to you. Live that type of proactive life. And you say, I'm a citizen of the kingdom. And because I'm a citizen of the kingdom, I'm going to live for God. And as I live for God, then I'm going to serve others. And when I serve others, I'm going to treat them just like I would like for them to treat me. 
But you know how I'm going to treat them? I'm going to treat them as if I'm a child of the king, which I am. And I'm going to honor them. I'm going to respect them. And then when that happens, guess what? They're going to treat me that same way, I guess. But that's not really the purpose. My purpose is that I'm going to serve my God, the king, because I am a citizen of the kingdom. And so when we read through the Sermon on the Mount, anytime you flip through those pages and you get to chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, you always come back to verses 7 through 11, especially, and say, Lord, it's a great reminder that I need to keep on asking, keep on seeking, and I need to keep on knocking. Okay? I want to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes for just one moment. As we get ready to kind of wind down our service, we're getting ready to move into a time of, um, of the Lord's Supper. I want this to resonate with you about keeping on asking, seeking, and knocking. Will you at this time make a commitment to the Lord and say, God, this week, I don't want to look at the things that are being shared in the Sermon on the Mount as attributes and ideals that are so beyond me. But what I'd like to do is whenever I see those things, Lord, I want those to draw me to you and to say, oh, God, I know I need that. I know I need help in that area. And when those areas come up in your life, do not let Satan come and gain the victory by just beating you down on them. But when those things come, those things that you struggle with that we have been talking through, your first response would be to go to God in prayer. You start right there. And don't make it just a one-time deal. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. And our God, our Heavenly Father, the one who's trustworthy, he's good, he's wise, he's accessible, he's in control. He is the one who gives us all good things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.